Memory is a curious thing. It's fallible, changeable, often inaccurate, but it can also be beautiful. Inevitably, it underwrites our personal identities, bending us into the shape of our pains and our joys. Introduce trauma, however, and your memory, even your sense of self becomes fragmented, like a shattered mirror. Memory is an overarching theme of this story, Jane's memory in particular. Can we extract reliable facts from it? Can we trust it? Or is it merely mirages of the past, built up from the stuff of our wishes and hopes as much as our actual experience? Today, we'll explore the odd memories of Larry Moulton's children. And then, we're going to travel back in time. You're listening to Dark Valley, an investigative series from Crawlspace Media and Glassbox Media. I'm your host, Jennifer Amell. This is episode 11. Dark Valley is possible because you listen. Be an advocate for these cases by rating and reviewing Dark Valley. It really does make a difference. Episodes are released weekly, but if you want to binge the whole series, sign up for our subscription show on Apple Podcasts and get exclusive access to bonus content. It's easy to favor one suspect in a murder investigation. It can be an insidious line of thinking, so subtle we don't even notice our own bias. And it's happened to the best of us, law enforcement, attorneys, psychologists, journalists. And I'm not throwing stones. It happened to me too. But we began this journey with a mantra. We have to keep an open mind. Last episode, we discussed Larry and Claude Moulton, their insertion into Maura Murray's 2004 missing persons case, and their odd points of confluence in the Valley murders of the 1980s. We discovered three things that puts Larry Moulton in direct proximity to three victims. One, Larry lived across the street from Ellen Freed's apartment, an apartment that she moved into only two months before her murder. Two. This apartment that Larry lived in was also in the same building as Eva Morse's ex-girlfriend, Deborah. We've learned that Eva was most probably headed to Deborah's house the day of her murder. And three, Larry worked at a factory across the street from Leo's Market on Main Street in Claremont. Bernice Cordemanche would have walked right past his workplace before also being murdered. Ellen Freed was last known to have been talking on a payphone at Leo's Market. We must remember that all these things are circumstantial and are not evidence of guilt. But for the sake of argument, let's say Larry is a good suspect for these murders. It requires us not only to accept the fact that Larry inserted himself into the Maura Murray case and put the knife in his brother's hand and that he had opportunities to encounter three victims, but to consider that there is not one valley killer, but two or more. It requires us to let go of this Hollywood serial killer trope, propagated by the crimes of Ted Bundy and Dennis Rader, the BTK, that they're lone wolf types, leading double lives as family men by day and killers by night. That story is oversimplified and makes it easier for us to see them as exceptional monsters. Here's a pretty surprising statistic. Criminologist Michael Arntfield said in an interview that at least 40% of serial killers work with a partner at some time. 40%. Let that sink in. A partner may not participate in the actual killings, but they might drive getaway cars, help dispose of bodies, or provide false alibis. This concept of duo serial killers is severely understudied. 
There's one psychologist who's performed some statistical analysis on this dynamic. His dissertation teases apart the key differences in what he calls, quote, solo and team serial killer profiles. Yeah, my name is Dr. Matt Wooster. I uh, am a clinical psychologist practicing in the field of forensic psychology out of uh, Akron, Ohio. Yeah, so the uh, title is Differences Between Solo and Team Serial Killers. So I, I got a hold of a serial killer database that is actually what it's called. It's called the Serial Killer Database. So what I did was take that data set, I pulled demographic information and then five key variables that I pulled out of some um, you know, research and review of profiling. Those five things are number of victims, length of career, method of killing, motive for killing, and relationship to victim. So I essentially took all of that data, split them up into two categories, uh, obviously solo and team killers, and then we used a cluster analysis uh, statistical review to generate uh, what are commonly referred to as typologies or clusters of you know, some of these variables that tend to stick together in predictable and noticeable patterns. According to Dr. Wooster's findings, solo rather than team killers tend to use more intimate methods of murder such as rope, strangulation, or a knife. Data also suggests that team killers more often murder for financial gain. Think gang murders, or siblings that kill a parent to gain an inheritance, that sort of thing. The primary motive and the most common motive for team killers was actually one of financial gain. Um, so in those cases, you know, given that the motive is purely financial, those intimate methods are generally thought of as being more personal, more aggressive, and more process focused. So if my process and the focus of my motive is violence, enjoyment, sadism, things like that, then I am more prone to use those types of methods. Um, and that tends to be a more common MO of uh, a, a solo killer, somebody who's purely killing for enjoyment or you know some of the other um, common motives there. So I think in, in that sense, it's probably just a reflection of the statistical differences in motive between team and, and solo killers, in my, I guess in my opinion, yeah. Taken alone, it seems like the Valley murders are more indicative of a solo rather than a team killer. However, there are definitely documented cases of family members that killed for enjoyment and use intimate methods of murder. Ken Bianchi, for example, He's otherwise known as the Hillside Strangler. He committed rapes and murders with his cousin, Angelo Buono Jr. Both men would sexually abuse their victims and usually strangle them, but sometimes they tried other methods of killing, like poisoning, lethal injection, and electric shock. The thing about profiling is that it relies on statistical trends to talk about patterns of likelihood. Data tells you how things could be. There's no statistic that gives you absolute certainty, especially not about one person or one situation. So the statistics suggest that the Valley murders were perpetrated by one person, but it doesn't preclude other scenarios. Claude Moulton is still living in New Hampshire, although word has traveled that he is suffering from an illness. His older brother Larry Moulton passed away on January 4th of 2007, surrounded by family in his Gold Street residence in Claremont. His obituary notes that he, quote, enjoyed his family and loved to fish on warm, sunny days, end quote. That sounds pretty wholesome. However, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the part of Dr. Philpin's profile of the Valley Killer, suggesting that this person would be an avid fisherman or huntsman. It's a common enough pastime in the valley, but it also might make one familiar with the tributaries of the Connecticut River and the surrounding forests. All the women who were murdered in the valley were eventually found in the woods and near bodies of water, with the exception, of course, of Linda Moore, who was killed in her home. I also reached out to Larry's family to learn more about him. I'm withholding names, but I spoke separately first to his son, and then to his daughter. When I contacted his son via text, I eventually asked him why he thought his father might have accused his uncle of harming Mora, 
Larry's son then volunteered a rather cryptic piece of information. I asked my colleague Tim to help me out. What you're about to hear is a dramatization of this brief but confusing conversation. And don't worry, we'll unpack it after. If you were a killer and found a shoe, sock, or bones, would you turn it into the authorities? Do you mean if I found the remains of someone and I was guilty of murdering someone else? No, all has to do with Sea Town and the River Ones. Now I'm confused. Are you speaking metaphorically, or are you trying to say Larry himself was guilty of something? No, people accuse like they did with my father, but when he found that, he gave it to them and showed them where. Wait, you're talking about giving the knife over, right? But showing what? No, the river case, my father, is the one who found the foot. Wait, what foot? That's the first I've heard of that. Do they know who the foot belonged to? Did your father say where he found it? Out fishing in Kellyville, New Hampshire. So what, he found this foot and just contacted authorities and had nothing to do with the valley cases after that? Why would he? So we're talking about two separate events here, right? Larry finds the foot, and then many years later he accuses his brother of Murray's disappearance and turns over a knife? Do the two things have anything to do with each other? Or did he suspect that Claude had something to do with the valley cases? (laughs) You're not from around here, are you? Why do you think their list is so long of people they have accused on both cases? Uh, probably because it's gone unsolved for so long, but you tell me. Okay, to start with, how did the cops deal with the Murray case from day one? Uh, I'm not sure. Perhaps it's because there's so little answers in that case, and it can easily turn into conspiracy. Well, this phone is about to die. The customer you're trying to reach is not available. Please call back 19T2. Okay, so what started as a conversation about Maura Murray turned into a bizarre story about Larry Moulton finding a human foot in the Sugar River in Kellyville during the time of the Valley murders. And further, Kellyville is an area between Claremont and Newport, New Hampshire, where the bodies of Ellen Freed and Bernice Cordemanche were found. And as far as I know, none of the victims were missing a foot. Side note, the roads that run north and south of this site are named Blood Road and Cuts Road. You can't write this stuff. I brought this up to several people who were in the area at the time, and none of them remembered a human foot being found. Then I scoured the archives to see if I could find any mention of it in an old newspaper. I only found one article, and that was from 2001, so after the time period that we're talking about. A human foot in a sneaker was found floating in Newfound Lake near Bristol, New Hampshire, about one hour northeast of Claremont. The person who found it was a Marine Patrol supervisor named David Learned. The foot likely belonged to a man who drowned in that lake in 1992. Other than that, nothing. Weeks after my conversation with Larry's son, I contacted Larry's daughter. And unprompted, she wrote the following. Quote, My dad and I never got to be very close due to drug addiction, and then him passing away when I was 22. I wish I got to know my father better. Because he was not a bad person, he just struggled with addiction. I will say I know he found a foot while fishing, what part of water I'm unsure of, and unfortunately can't ask. End quote. Our conversation dropped off after that. Then two months later, I pinged her again, and this is what she wrote. Quote, If it's about the foot, I just spoke with my mother, and she's saying neither of them were involved with that. End quote. I clarified, asking, so he never found the foot. She replied, quote, He did, but that's as much as my mom knows. My mom meant if you're trying to figure out who murdered the person whose foot it was, she's certain it wasn't him or his brother. End quote. And that's all she wrote. Literally. Literally. 
Okay, we have two people independently corroborating the story about Larry finding a foot. So I don't doubt that Larry was going around telling the story. But I just can't confirm the fact of it. Even if it is true, just because someone finds human remains doesn't mean they killed them. Larry's son also mentioned that his father was questioned by law enforcement in the Valley murders in the 80s. As far as I know, no law enforcement or affiliated investigator recognized the name Moulton as being part of the investigation at any point. Dr. Philbin is pretty sure Larry and Claude were never brought up during his time working with the task force. But speaking of Dr. Philbin, we did entertain this theory of multiple killers. First, Dr. Philbin and I were discussing Ellen Freed's case. As a refresher, Ellen was talking to her sister at a drive-up payphone at Leo's Market in Claremont. Days after Ellen disappeared, her car was found parked on Jarvis Lane. And a little over a year after that, her body was found miles away, across town and near the Sugar River. When her car is found, it's locked and the keys are inside. No blood. So if her, if she's pulled up to the payphone, her driver's door is blocked. You can't pull her out. Right. So he either got into her car from the passenger or back seat, or, or he didn't accost her there and followed her home. Well, he still has two cars to dispose of. Mm-hmm. This is the one that like makes more sense in my mind if there's two people. Uh, I, that was going through my head right at that minute. Yeah. Well, if there's two of them, then, then we uh, are obligated to go back to your molten theory. It's not impossible for one person to have abducted Ellen and dumped her car, but it would be logistically more difficult. Bear with me for a minute because the geography of this is very important. Leo's Market is where Ellen encounters the Valley Killer, which is in the center of Claremont on Main Street. Jarvis Lane, where Ellen's car was found, is three miles northwest of Leo's Market. Then Ellen's body is found in the opposite direction about seven miles east of Leo's Market. So the order of events is hard to guess at. If the killer was in Ellen's car, did he force her to drive to the river where she was later killed? Throw in the fact that where Ellen's body was found is not necessarily where she was killed. But if the killer was in Ellen's car, did he force her to drive to the river? We do speculate that Ellen was alive when she marched across that covered bridge because it was a little unstable and to drive a vehicle across it would be a little risky. Then, would he have driven the car to Jarvis Lane to dump it? And either get in his own stashed vehicle, or have someone pick him up? What Dr. Philpin and I were discussing is if this scenario makes more sense with two people, a tandem driver to either dump the car simultaneous to the murder, or to pick up the killer from the dump site. Otherwise, the killer would have had to stash a car, walk a long distance, or call someone from a payphone to be picked up. One other scenario is that the killer hung on to Ellen's car for a day or so, and then dumped it. But that seems risky to have the vehicle of a missing person. There's also a few more instances where multiple people are discussed. There is one account from what is believed to be an eyewitness who saw Bernice Cordemash getting into a white truck with two men. But this has never been substantiated. Additionally, it's been said that there were multiple people involved in the abduction of Barbara Agnew from that rest stop on I-91. If you recall the deathbed confession of Gary Westover, he said he and two other men were responsible for killing a woman that fits the case of Barbara Agnew. What doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me is if it is the same two killers as Ellen, why did they leave Barbara's car behind at the rest stop? Why not drive it elsewhere, like they did with Ellen's? And what about Maura Murray's case? I asked her sister Julie if she thought it would be possible that Larry or Claude could be responsible for some or all of the Valley murders. I think it is possible from based on the data points that I know, based on what we've gathered over the last 19 years, I do think it is possible because 
I I don't think that Mara's disappearance is just a one-off. It could be. It could be. Um, but for somebody to completely vanish off the face of the earth and not a trace be left behind and no one said anything, it tells me that somebody at least knew a little bit to be able to get away with it for 19 years. And so now we look back and you look at the Connecticut Valley River Killers, same situation, you know, there's, there hasn't been an arrest and you've got multiple victims. And so somebody is out there or was out there that got away with this. So is it, are there multiple people out there that can do this type of thing and get away with it? Yes, we know that, but in such a small area. I mean, we're talking about the same exact area with some of these cases and um, some of these people. So, you know, I'm not one to say, yep, that's off the table. I like to keep everything on the table because at this point we don't know, we, you know, we don't know. One thing that I say all the time is every data point that we find could be as equally as important as it is insignificant. And we will not know until we know. So we can't cross things off. And so that's just my approach. So to answer your question, I, I mean, I do think it's possible. I bet you're wondering what Jane thinks about all this. Here she is. Some of the information that you come up with has been so intriguing to me. It's like, um, like the two brothers there with Mora, and then find out how closely connected geographically they were with Ellen. Yeah. I mean, that was so intriguing. It was like, oh my God, check that out, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, maybe nothing would ever come about it. It could probably be absolutely nothing. But I don't know, for some reason, I don't want to say I like hearing this information, but it's just so intriguing to me. They add up, but yet, <laughs> here I go. <laughs> no, please, poke holes in it. They have so much history in Claremont that, it makes sense that they would be there, there would be so many um, coincidences. I'm going to call it, which I don't believe in coincidences, but I'm going to call it coincidences because they do have so much history in in Claremont. And back then, Claremont wasn't as big as it is today. Right, right. So, you know, I kind of got to think about that too. No, you're you're totally right. If, if that makes sense, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I've started to think of Claremont as this like, like weird, like refraction of the universe. <laughs> because like, yes. any name that I search, it's like, oh, they lived here next door to this person that I also know, or I've read about before. But it's like, everybody has the same name. There's, yeah, it was a small area, like most of them were employed in factories. Like, it's not. Yeah, because I mean, deal. Claremont built up a lot over the past 30 years. Yeah. Like, they didn't have the stores that they had, that they have today. You know, it was, it was a lot smaller. And I'm sure if you check population back then compared to the population now, I bet there weren't even half the people living in Claremont back in the 80s than there is now. So, yeah, I mean, and I don't think there was that many places to work in Claremont back then. Mm-hmm. Because it wasn't, it wasn't built up like it is today. And it was a small town. Everybody pretty much knew everybody, especially if you got in a lot of trouble. Brought <laughs> um, attention to yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right to point that out, Jane. Because sometimes it feels like, oh, there's too many coincidences. But it's it still is. possible they are coincidences. I mean, I still, I still think they're worth looking at. Absolutely. Sure. Um, I wish there was some sort of DNA that could be done with either Eva or 
or Ellen or, or Barbara, you know, or even me, I wish there was some kind of DNA that they could do with them because I do think that they're still worth looking at. I'm, I'm not discarding them at all, especially Larry. Yeah, I think it's important to have a balanced perspective on it. I wish I could say something conclusive about the Moulton brothers. I will say that all the information I've uncovered has been sent to the New Hampshire and Vermont State Police. It's up to them if they choose to investigate further. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thank you for listening. Now, back to the show. I have to say, I've never spent as much time going over the details of a single story as I have with Jane's attack. I close my eyes. I try to visualize it. The choreography plays out in dream logic. Jane and the killer are in the car, now out of the car, now back in. Dr. Philpin has been mulling this macabre dance for decades, not to mention Jane herself. It plays for her like an acid-eaten film strip, skipping frames, sunspots, reds bleeding into purples or blues into greens. It was about a year ago when Dr. Philpin told me about how he hypnotized Jane a few months after her attack to try and sift out the details from Jane's traumatized memory. Then, he said he might still have a recording of this session. Naturally, I got very excited. But then he explained that there had been a fire in the college archive where his tapes were kept, and he didn't know if Jane's hypnosis tape made it out. First, throw out everything you know about hypnosis. Dr. Philpin was a student under the father of clinical hypnosis, Milton Erickson. In Erickson's book, Hypnotic Realities, he writes the following, quote, Trance is a special state that intensifies the therapeutic relationship and focuses the patient's attention on a few inner realities. Trance does not ensure acceptance of suggestions. End quote. Trance, or hypnosis, is a state we all have and can access. Take, for example, your commute to work each day. Do you remember each stoplight and tree on your route? Clinical hypnosis feels a lot like this. It's not necessarily uncovering an unconscious or buried memory, but merely provides an alternate avenue to access this memory. A psychologist administering this does not suggest memories. They are only opening doors and letting you walk through. This spring, I received a package in the mail. So I just got a small brown package in the mail from Dr. Philpin. All right, I'm gonna open it. Oh my goodness. So inside are three discs labeled Jane (laughs) Borowski. I guess I need to go get a DVD player. What you're about to hear is the original audio from Dr. Philpin's Hypnosis of Jane on February 2nd, 1989, just six months after her attack. There's also a video element, which obviously you can't see. The camera is pointing down at Jane. Dr. Philpin sits just behind it, at a frame. His voice comes across very clearly, whereas it's a little hard to hear Jane's voice, especially while she's under hypnosis. So I'll jump in to clarify when necessary. In the video, Jane is in Dr. Philpin's office in Vermont. Jane sits slouched in a big plaid chair trying to make herself small, wearing a light blue sweater, her hair nicely feathered, a lit cigarette in her right hand, ashtray off to the side. It's all very 80s, and honestly, kind of eerie. 
I'm going to present this hypnosis audio a little out of order, but I made this choice so the information would be more clear. There are three sections to these interviews. Jane in trance, Jane out of trance, and Jane talking to Dr. Philpin and a New Hampshire State Police detective. The first part you're going to hear is Jane and Dr. Philpin talking about the details of her attack after the hypnosis. At this point in the conversation, Jane described stopping at Gamarlo's store, seeing a Jeep Wagoneer with wood grain siding pull into a spot next to her, and the man coming to her driver's side window. Here we go. All right, now, before he, he opened the door and came into the car, he, he said something to you. Is the phone working tonight? Is the phone working tonight? Okay. And when he said that, what did you do? I didn't have a chance to do anything because right after he said that, he opened the door and was in my car. Did you look up when he said? Mm -hmm. No, not really. Okay. What were you looking at when he said, is the phone working tonight? I guess I was looking down at my soda. You had it in your hand? Yeah, I had it, like, sitting on the console. Okay. Had you opened it? No. Okay. Had you turned your car back on yet? No. When he got in and he tried to grab me, I, like, kind of jumped over on the passenger side and I kept kicking him. Yeah. And when I did, I remember kicking the ignition and I remember kicking the windshield. Windshield cracked. Yeah. Um, I screamed when I was screaming. Okay. What was he saying during that time? He wanted me to come with him. How did he say it? Come with me. And then right after I screamed, he said, you want to be like that? And that's when he took his knife. Now, during that period of time, and I want to get it, get it as right as I can here, mm -hmm. you, you correct me when I'm wrong. He grabbed you by your wrist. And he said, come with me. Yeah. You started screaming. Mm -hmm. All right. And there already was this struggle going on. And you kicked, and you know you kicked the ignition area. Mm -hmm. You know you kicked the windshield. And then it cracked the windshield. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then he said, you want to be like that. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, After right after I screamed. Right before I screamed, I said, please don't hurt me because I'm pregnant. Did he have any reaction to that statement? No. He didn't say anything? No. Um, did he hesitate? No. Then you screamed. Mm -hmm. And he said, you want to be like that. And when he said that, then... He took the knife out. Okay. And the knife is coming out with his left hand mm -hmm. from the back from the back somewhere from the back of the side okay and when the knife came out in his left hand his right hand is occupied holding your wrist when he first brought the knife up started to bring it up did you see it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the first time you saw it the very first time you saw it what was it you saw? Just a knife. Okay. How much of it did you see? I don't know, probably just the blade. Okay, you saw the blade. Right. So, um, when it came out, uh, it wasn't a case of his having to open it in any way. Not that I noticed. All right. Uh, yeah, point there. I never thought of that. Because his right hand was occupied holding my wrist. Yeah. And he pulled that out. Obviously, he didn't open it. Yeah. Sometimes two know. heads are better than one, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. We got out of the car. I remember the door open. And I remember him dropping the knife. And I remember I was toward the front. 
Let me stay there. And somehow he got me down on the ground. This was after he dropped the knife? Mm -hmm. Okay. From what hand did the knife drop? I assume it dropped. Okay. And where was his right? As I was getting out of the car, he still had his hand on my wrist. His right hand? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it had to drop from the left? Mm -hmm. And then, however it is you got there, you end up around by the front fender, and this is after he's dropped the knife. Mm -hmm. Okay. He shut the car door. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was he still holding on to you? I don't know. He might have been, because somehow he knocked me down to the ground. I don't remember. Okay. But this, again, is toward the front of the car, where mm -hmm. he knocked you down to the ground. When I was on the ground, my head was right by the front tire. You remember seeing the front tire? Mm-hmm. Okay. What was he saying? He wasn't saying anything. He was just strangling me, choking me. With what hand? Both hands. Both hands? Both hands. On your throat? Mm hmm And he was not saying anything? Somehow, I need him off me. And he said, wait till I get that knife. Okay. Somehow you need him in such a way that he got off you. Mm -hmm. And he said, wait till I get that knife. Mm -hmm. Then what happened? He went over and got the knife. He walked away from you? Mm -hmm. Two feet away from me. Was he still holding you? Mm -hmm. He let go of you mm -hmm. and moved away from you, even if only a couple of feet. Mm -hmm. To get the knife. Yeah. Then what happened? I get up to my feet and he picked up the knife and he grabbed my wrist. What hand did he grab your wrist with? And his left hand on my right hand. My right wrist. Yeah. Like that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And he had the knife? In his right hand. In his right hand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then what? He's started pulling me to the back of the car uh -huh. and then I was standing there and he said he said you beat up my girlfriend and I said I didn't and he said is this a Massachusetts car and I said no so he let go and he started walking away which way did he start to walk away in the back of the car Back toward his car? Mm -hmm. How far did he get? Just really to the back of it. Of your car? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I said, what about my windshield? And he just turned around, came back to me, and had me against the car and put the knife up against my neck. All right. And I started running to the road. And I was jumping. Like I was doing jumping jacks, I was just jumping and waving my hands and yelling. And the next thing I knew, the vehicles just kept going. And he had me down on the ground again. The next thing I know, he was stabbing me. That's where I was looking most of the time. He was stabbing me, he was down on me, down on myself. Why do you think he stopped when he did? Why do I think he stopped my opinion? Yes. I think he stopped because he was afraid somebody was going to drive by. It was a, a well-traveled road. Yeah. And he probably took me for dead. Oh, okay, why do you think he might have taken you for dead? Mm -hmm. He stabbed me quite a few times. Mm -hmm. There's blood everywhere. Mm -hmm. This is the first time that I've heard Jane's attacker tried to strangle her. That's important when we think of patterns. If it is the Valley Killer, then it seems he has a fixation on women's necks. Should we be looking at strangulation deaths as well? I wonder. But first, there are more details. When Jane was back in her car, behind her attacker's vehicle on the road, 
she was able to remember some of the characters of the license plate. Here's Dr. Philpin explaining this to Detective Mike LeClaire with the New Hampshire State Police. Now let's see if we can take um, what you've come up with and pick Mike's brain a little bit. Mm. See if we can't come up with a finished product for this. Okay. Okay. We'd like we'd, we'd like you to join us. For sure. That. That's a that's a real bugging device that you've got. Yeah, that's a, very sensitive, and that's okay. Um, we'd like your in, in expert input at this point. Um, is that still recording? Uh, y yours is. Mine just shut off. Oh, okay. During the um, the period of time that Jane was uh, in in trance and relaxed, there were. Uh, a couple of um, pictures that I asked her to bring back with her. One of them was um, the license plate of the vehicle. And this was from the point in time when she was driving very closely behind the vehicle after the attack. Now, and it, it, I think you've got most, if not all, of this on there. And we do have some confusion about some numbers and letters. But this is basically the conversation that we had about the picture of the plate. It's white, um, and the printing on the plate is green. Mm. Um, it is a New Hampshire license plate. It has a red sticker in the right corner, in the right corner of the plate that has either an 87 or an 88 on the sticker. She thinks it's an 88 on the red sticker. Just, just let me go through the whole thing and then, you know, you, you react. Um, this license plate was very dirty, was very muddy, and that's why some of the clarity isn't entirely there. Um, but the way Jane said it was, I know that it begins with 662, okay? Then either a 1 and a 5 or a 7 and a 5, possibly an N. And then she said, I know that I'm missing something. I know that the N is towards the end, and I almost think there was an L or an I before the N. So the variations um, are fairly limited, I would think. Obviously, if you have all of those in there, you have a plate that is too long. She's sure of the 662. Then possibly 1.5 or 7.5. Right, we have a question about that. Mm -hmm. um, we've got an N near the end. And then she almost thinks there's an L or an I before the N. So those are the variations. Now somewhere in that, um, what what can you do with okay. that? I could do a lot with a six six two. Okay. I could do a, num a, a, a large number of things with a six six two. No question about it. Those three. If it's a New Hampshire plate, and, in, and going back to what you told me about the red sticker, that's indicative of being uh, valid through 89, mm -hmm. okay? Which uh, could possibly mean, uh, I can give an example, if there was anything registered prior to August of 1988, mm -hmm. and it was re-registered, it, it would expire in 89, so we're talking, um, July, June, May, April, March, February, or January of 88 that could have a validation sticker on it, a red validation sticker of 1989. Mm -hmm. That is the current validation year. It begins with a 662. That begins with a 662. Anything okay. from January 1st of 88 uh, that had to be, re would have had to be up to uh, July 31st that had to be re-registered for 89 
I'll have that uh, will be in, in the computer. Okay, so it's just a matter of pulling it out of it's the computer. It's just a matter of pulling it out and um, the, the, the one five or the seven five or the L, the I, the N, that could, those could be numbers. It's unlikely that they are letters because we have a six number digit system in New Hampshire. We have just changed this year to three letters and three numbers. But prior to that, unless it was a, what we call a um, initial plate. Initial plates being that if you uh, go into the registry and you decide that you want uh, 662 LIN, Mm -hmm. You can get that plate if you're willing to pay the extra $25 over and above right. the normal registration fees. Okay. But the 662 will help me immensely, and I can narrow that down and look at only Jeep Wagoneers. Okay. The additional suggestion that I'd, that I'd make um, for, for the obvious reason that uh, I assume that some people in New Hampshire are like some people in Vermont, and they freely move license plates from vehicle to vehicle without yes. always being terribly responsible That's about correct. it. Yes. Um, I'd look at uh, all the vehicles, not just the Wagoneers. Okay, what I would do with the 662 once I came up with uh, something that was close, even though it may not list a Wagoneer, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'd go to those people and I'd look through the uh, stolen or missing plates reports to see if it was a report of stolen or missing. Perfect. Okay. I'll, I'll check all the angles on this, um, you know, like you say, it could be a, a, what we call a screwdriver transfer. They just take the plates off one vehicle, put it in the other, mm -hmm. and, and you could return. You know, if it's stolen, and that, I'll be able to find that out mm -hmm. uh, by checking with the owners. I mean, I'll check all the 662s, and uh, because that 662 can only run from 6620002999. to 999. So there's less than a thousand. There's less than a thousand, yes. And also, the 662 is uh, to some degree indicative of where the plate was issued. Mm -hmm. um, Do you know offhand? No, I don't. Uh, uh, years ago, uh, we used to have uh, what they, we call county plates. If you like registered in a specific county, I could tell you strictly. See, we didn't have the name of the county on the plate, but if you had uh, like um, CC61, I could tell you that that plate was registered in Cheshire County. Mm -hmm. Or if you had an S, S, uh, whatever, I could tell you it was registered in Sullivan County. Mm -hmm. We've gotten away from that, but the 662 only because the plates are um, given to certain, um, not that they are particularly done that way, but there a number of plates are, are, are given out to a, a registry. Mm -hmm. And as they give those plates out, they have a numerical order. Mm -hmm. So all I have to find out is where that numerical order 662 was, and I can start right from there. Like. Uh, We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thank you for listening. Now, back to the show. Now, for the hypnosis. You're going to hear Jane while in a trance. Fair warning, parts of this audio are disturbing. And what are you seeing, Jane? Open the car door. You open the car door. What's happening? Standing outside. What does he look like? No. Wait. Play that back. No. Does he look like someone you know? Yes. 
If you didn't catch that, Jane says, I know him. She goes on to describe his appearance. What does he look like? High forehead. He has a high forehead. Long face. Long face. Light hair. His hair is light. Clean. He's clean. Later, when Jane is out of trance, Dr. Philpin questions her about this. Let's um, just talk again for a few minutes about a um, fairly strong feeling that you have that this is somebody you've seen before. What, mm-hmm. what do you connect that to? Mm-hmm. How long ago would you, might you have seen him before? A while ago. Months, years? Probably years. Probably years. Probably somebody that I've only seen once, twice. Just a very familiar face. Do you think you recognized him at that moment as somebody you might have seen before? Not at the time. I think at the time I was too scared. Okay. But not somebody you knew real well? No. Somebody you dated? No. Wouldn't be, wouldn't be somebody you knew that well? No. Okay. Years ago, some years ago, from New Hampshire, from Massachusetts, from Vermont. Somebody you just would have seen, like passing in the store, or somebody you might have seen where you were working at one point, or somebody you might have seen at a party you went to. Try to explain. Just do the best you can. I've seen a few, quite a few people through Dennis. He knows a lot of people. It's almost like that's the way I've seen him. Somehow you saw, possibly now we're talking, somehow you saw this guy through Dennis. Somebody Dennis knows. Or somebody that Dennis knows. Somebody that a friend of Dennis knows. How long have you known Dennis? Three years. Okay. So this is somebody that you would have seen within the past three years. Mm -hmm. And probably further back. I mean, not like two months ago or three months ago, but more like a year or two years or three years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Nobody I've seen since my dad. Okay. Did you have any sense that he recognized you? No. Just um, follow your thoughts. Again, don't struggle with it. Don't work at it. Just follow your thoughts. I can't remember where I could have possibly seen him before. Okay. What kind of uh, work does uh, Dennis do? Oh, God. He runs a hydrodium. Um, works over at Sassafra Lumber. Works with Lumber. Drives Loader. He used to work for Beam and Lumber mm-hmm. in Winchester. How long ago was that? That was three years ago when I first met him. Okay. And um, when did he get through over there? He got through there about, about a year after I met him. Then about a year after that, he went back. All right. What was he doing for that year in between? I'm working on his Hospitals. Okay. And that's like a lumber place also? Yeah, they're both lumber places. Okay. Um, and when you first met him, he had um, a group of friends, mm-hmm. people that he hung out with, that, that kind of thing. That's how I met him. Okay. But this person that we're talking about, if, if you had seen him through Dennis, this would not be one of Dennis's close friends, because mm-hmm. you'd know that. Yeah. Um, but it would have been somebody that you might have seen because of Dennis, even though Dennis might not know him. Yeah. Okay. Does Dennis know a lot of people? Yeah. He does. Okay. Um, and aside from work, what kinds of things does he do or what kinds of places does he go that bring him into contact 
with a lot of people. It would be like this, you know, very slight acquaintance or a friend of a friend or whatever. Yes, you usually go to like mud bogs and chalk pools at the church fair, at the fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. Church fair. These are places you'd go with him? Yeah. Yeah. Not too many places other than that. What about parties? No. You used to. Went to a couple of them, Brad. I'm eating over in Winchester. Mm hmm. That's what happened about two years ago. Okay. So it could have been somebody that you might have seen, like going to uh, to a truck pull. Could have been somebody that you had seen at a party. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily somebody Dennis knows. Mm -hmm. Could it be somebody that he knows a little bit, slightly, you know, just in passing, somebody that you say hi to, but you don't really know. Maybe Dennis knows a lot of people. From the description that you had given before, and from the composite, that didn't remind Dennis of anybody. Okay. Well, it's just keep your possibilities open. You don't have to close any of them off. Possibly. Okay. When I sent Jane these tapes, she had never seen them before. It was a pretty big deal. I asked her to give me a call after she watched them. Hi, Jen. How you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing okay. You watched the videos last night? I did. How are you feeling about it? It was, um... <laughs> wow. You'll hear more of Jane's reaction next time. There's only one more episode in this season of Dark Valley. It's been almost three years since I started this project, and I thought my work here was, if not necessarily finished, then wrapping up. That was until I received this voicemail from Dr. Philpin. You've uh, worked through all of these cases, that, but there's one you have yet to look at Heidi Martin's murder. And I think that's one that you have to take a look at. Dark Valley is produced, written, and edited by me, Jennifer Amell. It's also made possible by executive producers with Crawl Space Media, Tim Polari, and Lance Reinsterna. Follow us on social, at Dark Valley Show. Production assistants include Amanda Bedard and Marianne Stone-White. Show art by Pamela Robinson. Original theme song by Jennifer Paig. Please see the show notes for additional music credits, courtesy of Pixabay. And if you have a tip for any of these cases, please call the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit at 603-271-2663 or the Vermont State Police Major Crimes Unit at 802-244-8781 or you can write to us at darkvalleyshow at gmail.com. Until next time.